Saga's Return, Planeswalkers New and Old, and Phyrexians? This is Cal Magawa, Neon Dynasty, our first look at the new set. Let's jump right in, take a look. Sagas are back. That's right, Sagas are back here, and uh, it looks like enchantments are going to play a pretty big theme here in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, our first saga of many. Not to spoil too much, a lot to happen here uh, so far in these previews. Era of Enlightenment, 2 mana for a white common saga. Chapter 1, Scry 2. Chapter 2, Gain 2 Life. Chapter 3, and this is a big one, is the Flipski. That's right, we have sagas that are going to transform. And the backside of this is pretty simple, honestly. It's just a 2-2 two -two first striking enchantment creature. Um... Probably not going to see much play constructed, although as a limited card, this card's pretty reasonable. Um, you get some scry, you get some life, and you get a pretty good body for the cost, as well as enchantment synergies, which we may see coming forward. Uh, looks pretty cool. Our next saga is <sighs> Makiko's Reign of Truth. This is an uncommon white saga. Two mana again. Chapter 1 and 2. Target creature gets plus and plus 1 until end of turn for each artifact and or enchantment you control. So a little bit of a boost, and you flip it into Portrait of Machiko. Oh, so I'm, saying, so I'm saying it wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, and it's an enchantment creature, human noble. It gets plus and plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. So itself, it's a 1-1. It's a one -one. So it is self-perpetuating uh, in that respect. So it won't just die. That's not bad, honestly. If you're playing it with a lot of artifacts or enchantments in it, this could easily be a 5-5, five -five, a 6-6. Six -six. Um, the first two chapters aren't great. You know, plus and plus one. I mean, I guess for each artifact or jam, it could do some damage, you know, whatever. Um, kind of more a more all-in card. If you're a big artifact deck or you're a big enchantment deck, it's going to be a cool aggressive card. Kind of a cool one. Hard to parse exactly how valuable it'll be. Sort of like a, a threat on suspend with a little bit of cranial plating action to start. Seems pretty good. Seems pretty good. Up next is the Modern Age. Uh, two mana, Blue Common Saga. These are, I believe those are our first common sagas. Chapter 1 and 2, draw a card, then discard a card. So, not so great, honestly. You know, it's a, a, a really, really bad careful study. Uh, and then, Chapter 3, it flips into a 2-3 flyer. Probably a reasonable limited common. 2-3 flyer for, for 2, effectively, is pretty good. And then, of course, if there's any graveyard synergies at all. If you're discarding a card for value here, this card's pretty sweet. If you're not, it's not so great. But, um, it's an okay card. Pretty crazy art, too. Pretty, pretty wild-looking art. The Life of Toshiro Umizawa. And of course, Umizawa, uh, more well known for his, for his Chite and his actual card. Two mana for an, an uncommon saga. And chapter one and two, I mean, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Uh, the abilities of Umizawa's Chite. So plus one plus two to a creature, minus minus one to a creature, or gain two life. Very flexible. Very flexible card. This, in theory, can kill two small creatures. It can gain some life. It can pump your creatures. Uh, so pretty, pretty powerful effects there. And then it flips over into a two, three. That is tapped to pay one life and add a black to cast an instant or sorcery spell. Sorcery spell. Kind of a weird one on a black card. I'm not going to lie. This is a pretty weird effect for a black card to have. Uh, both making mana and only for instant or sorceries. I don't know. But um, it's a reasonable card. Probably a good limited card, obviously. You know, the effects are reasonable. A lot of what made Chite good was the instant speed aspect of it. So it's a little sorcery speed stuff. But probably a pretty cool limited card. Next is a red common saga. The Shattered States Error. Back in my day. And uh, five mana for a, a threaten at first. And then, of course, it goes back to your opponents. Next chapter, plus one, plus oh. It's on a turn for your creatures. And then it flips over into a 3-3 three, three trample haste. This card seems like an eh limited card. Um, five mana for a threaten is pretty tough. I think the first chapter of Saga is going to be really, really important. This one's not as exciting. Uh, but it is a haste threat. It is a you know a probably an okay limited card. Azusa. Many journeys here. Two mana for an uncommon Saga. Chapter 1, play an extra land. Chapter 2, gain 3 life. Chapter 3, flip into a 3-3. Three, three. And whenever it's blocked, you untap 3 lands. This card's good. Uh, this card's good. Sort of a suspend watch wolf. Once you play an extra land, you can gain some life. Definitely going to be a phenomenal limited card. Uh, phenomenal limited card. Constructed, we'll see. I don't know if you know these turbo land decks are going to want to have a 3-3 three, three in play. But as far as limited card goes, this one's awesome. Art's really cool, too. All these saga arts are phenomenal. Super, super cool. Super, super cool. Besage, you reach a skyward. We're going to see Besage you a little bit later as well. It's a pretty big surprise, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But Besage, you reach a skyward. Four mana for a saga. It's uncommon. Search library for two forest cards. Put them in your hand, then shuffle. And then you get to put one land from your graveyard on top of your library. And you get to exile it, and you get a pretty large creature. A XX reach. You basically get a uh, a uh, Renin 7 token in that it's a reach creature, 
as big as your lands. Uh, that's a pretty powerful creature. Again, this feels more like a limited card as well. Uh, not really doing enough on the front side to really uh, to warrant the cost. Um, it's basically just like a good card on suspend. Drawing some forest is pretty cool and limited too, but more of a limited card, but definitely a powerful li top end limited card uh, for sure. Dragon Comedy Reborn is a rare, a rare green enchantment. Chapter one and two. Gain two life. Look at the top, top three cards of your library. You can exile one of them face down with a hatching counter on it. Then put the rest of the bottom in any order. Then, of course, it flips on chapter three into Dragon Kami's Egg, an 01 egg creature. It's also an enchantment. Whenever it or a dragon you control dies, you may cast a creature spell from among cards you own in exile with hatching counters on them without paying its mana cost. This is the kind of, like, too many hoops kind of card. Uh, we see this before in a, a bunch of different, you know, egg cards, summoner's egg, and so on and so forth. A lot of hoops here. There has to be a good creature in your top six cards, uh, and then the creature has to die, and that can't be exiled, it can't be bounced. It's cute, uh, but realistically, this feels more like a pipe dream card than anything else, uh, but it's a cool card. It's pretty fun. Teachers of Akiran is next, another rare enchantment uh, for green, two mana. Two mana, chapter one, mill three, make a spirit. That's pretty good. Chapter 2, put a counter on a, on a creature, which can be the spirit, obviously. Chapter 3, flips into Kirin-touched Orochi, which is a snake monk creature, enchantment creature. Whenever it attacks, choose one. Exile a creature card from a graveyard and make a, make a, a token. Or exile a non-creature card and put a counter on a creature you control. This card's really good. Uh, on rate alone, this is basically a 2-2 two -two for 2 that comes into play and mills 3 cards, which is just good. You know, Seder Wayfinder kind of effect. And then the Saga flips, and you get another creature that has reasonably relevant effects. Obviously, a 1-1 one, one attacking isn't always going to happen all the time, but just a 2-2 two, two and a 1-1 one, one and a mill 3 cards for 2 mana is pretty good while also being an enchantment. Um, so it's important to note also that these Sagas exile, then come back in, so they won't have counters on them. That will trigger Constellation in older formats too, so just a possible thing to look out for. And our last Saga here is the Kami War, which is just an absurd, uh, absurd looking card here. Wooberg plus 1. Wooberg, and eh, call a spell that shop, promo code GM10. And uh, chapter one is exile target non land permanent opponent controls. So, obviously, very powerful, just exiles anything. Chapter two, return up to one other target non land permanent to its owner's hand. Then the opponent discards a card. So, we have a sort of like a, a an Elspeth Conqueror's Death, you know, the Eldest Reborn, just like really powerful saga here, and that like it kills a thing, it does another uh, powerful thing. And then chapter three, it flips into. Oh, Kanachi made manifest. 6-6 six, six dragon, all colors, flample. Whenever it attacks, if any player chooses a non-land card from your graveyard, in your graveyard, return that card to your hand, and it gets plus X plus O to end of turn with a mana value. Uh, so, definitely an Elspeth Conqueror's Death kind of card. You know, it's a very, very powerful saga. I'm, that one is really, really ugly. Uh, this card would look so much more aesthetically pleasing if it cost Wooburg, which leads me to believe this card was probably costed at Wooburg, and in design development, they said this is too good, we gotta up this thing. Uh, feels like Nimbus it Reborn, very hard to cast, but very, very powerful if you can cast it. Pretty fun looking card, we'll probably see play constructed if, uh, if there's a deck that can cast it, because the ability, ability is very, very powerful. So, moving on to, uh, some non-Saga cards here. Now, so Dragon Spirits are up. My article on CoolStuffInc.com might be preview one of these. Can I even say that? I'm not even sure, but coolstuffinc.com article tomorrow. Look for that. I, would, I, did, I did the preview article. And uh, we see here in Ayo, Ayo, the Dawn Sky, the white version, uh, Yosei's younger uh, sibling here. Five mana for a 5-4 flying vigilance dragon spirit. That fourth toughness, you know, that fifth toughness is a little missing. These all have ET et Death abilities, ETD abilities, enters on death, uh, payable on death, maybe a little better. And whenever it dies, choose one, look at the top seven cards of your library, put any number of non-land permanent cards with total value four or less from among them on the battlefield, rest in the bottom. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Or you can put two plus and plus encounters on each permanent you control. It's a creature or a vehicle. So when this thing dies, pump the entire team twice or go looking for some stuff. And uh, this feels very Revelark adjacent to me, where uh, it's a big threat, it dies, you can get multiple th you know, threats off of it, uh, card advantage is powerful, the pump team is powerful, and Revelark was of course a 4-3, this is a 5-4 with Vigilance. So it's a very, very powerful card. Also a dragon, a lot of dragon synergies in the set. I can only imagine there'll be, I mean, I'm sorry, in the format, I can only imagine there'll be some, uh, some spirit synergies as well. So pretty good curve stopper, Five mana is kind of a lot for like an aggro deck, but a more mid-range deck is card seems very, very good. Very, very powerful. Needs to find a home, though. Needs to find a home. Then we see the blue entry, Kaiga, a Tide Star, looking on fondly. Six mana 
for a 6-6 Legendary Dragon Spirit. Flying Ward 3, of course, Ward very powerful, not as powerful on a more expensive threat, because at this point in the game, your opponent will probably have the extra mana to pay for it, but nonetheless, pretty powerful. When it dies, choose one. Uh, payable on death. Return a, a number of target non-land permanents with, with total mana value six to us to your, their owner's hands, or mill six and return up to two instant or sorcerer cards from your graveyard to your hand. This feels like one of the weaker ones to me. Um, it does block very well with ward, and it's important to note that all of these are really good defensively. The big downside to playing a huge creature is you play it, they kill it, they attack you, and you're behind on tempo. The death triggers are huge for this, and this one in particular, if they uh, if they kill us, try and attack, you can bounce most of their board, which is pretty powerful. So, uh, also important to note, this can bounce any number of tokens because they have zero mana value and zero plus zero plus zero plus one or whatever, you know, and so on and so forth. So, uh, powerful effect. I don't think this is powerful enough though. Um, it's a decent like defensive creature, but it's not unkillable. The card advantage is a little weird because now we got to play instant sorceries. Um, this one feels a little off to me. Not not as good as the other ones we've seen so far. Up next is not part of a cycle, but also a dragon spirit. This is a rare. This is the Soul of Kamigawa, five mana. I'm sorry, four mana for a three three, three, three flying flash. It's pretty good. Whenever ETBs, other creature, or I'm sorry, another permanent you control gains indestructible for as long as you control this. So kind of like Restoration Angel, and they can come in and protect something. Um, the important part is that first shot. So they go to clear creature. You flash this in, protect it. And then even if they kill this later, at least you stop that removal spell. So it's two for one, which is pretty good. Then it has Wooberg. Getting out of use of a shirt I wore today, right? Uh, plus five, plus five on a turn. That's flavor text, I feel like. I think that's, that's almost never going to come up. Uh, but as a pseudo restoration angel, this is kind of an interesting card. Um, these cards haven't been too good, you know, in standard and other formats lately, but it's kind of a cool card. Could definitely see play. Uh, definitely tricky. If it has a home, it can do it. Oh boy. We got a big one here, folks. Basiju is back, and it's no longer colorless. And uh, the art is also... Woo! That's some nice art there. Uh, Basiju is a cycle... Uh, a part of a cycle of legendary lands that come in untapped and tapped for a color. Inconceivable! Didn't think we'd see these again, honestly. Uh, so... This is just basically a forest with no drawbacks other than it's not a forest. It's, an, it's a non-basic and it's legendary. Now, of course... WotC stopped doing Legendary Lands a while back uh, because they were annoying to players. You draw a second Legendary Land, you can't really play it, it kind of sucks. So these have been given the Channel Ability, which is from uh, Original Kamigawa, which allows you to pay a cost and discard the card and get an effect. Sort of like turning it into a spell. And the uh, ability here is two mana, discard this. You can destroy an artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land an opponent controls. Then they can search their library for a land with a basic land type, put it on the battlefield, untapped, important, then shuffle, this costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. So this can cost two or one. A little a little tiny bonus here if you have a legend to play. For the most part, though, this is just a two, like a sort of an Assassin's Trophy on a land for artifacts, enchantments, and non-basics. Now, it's important to note, Assassin's Trophy, super overhyped card, doesn't see much play. It is flexible, but giving your opponent untapped land is a huge cost. However, this is just a freaking forest. Uh, this is not a two-color instant. This is just a part of your mana base. And uh, this card's going to see play in every single format um, because it is just so easy to put in your deck. Um, you see it in Tron. We'll see it in Legacy Lands. Uh, we're going to see it in tons and tons of stuff. This one's insane for Tron, too, right? It's a way to find, the way to kill Blood Moon uh, off of your uh, Sylvan Scrying. Super cool. So this land's going to see play everywhere. Uh, again, it's not, like, ridiculously powerful, but it is a super flexible answer to things at a very low opportunity cost. This card's awesome. Uh, get your copies now. You didn't hear from me. All right? Or you did. Whatever. Moving on, we got some Planeswalkers as well. The Wanderer has been revealed, unmasked. So the Wanderer from War of a Spark. Uh, it was not Elspeth, as was, uh, was uh, you know, I don't, was a rumored. I don't keep my pul my finger on the pulse too much of uh, of the Vorthos community, but it was not Elspeth. It's just uh, a new Planeswalker from Kamigawa. Apparently has the problem where she's sort of like, uh, uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, oh, what's his name? From uh, show Quantum Leap. Uh, whatever his name is from Quantum Leap, uh, where she sort of just bounces from place to place and can't really control it. Uh, but the car we have here is very exciting. This is a Flash Planeswalker. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Flash Planeswalker, 4 mana 4, a 3 loyalty Planeswalker. When it ETBs, you can exile an ability once. So basically, a Flash Planeswalker doesn't work like Teferi who uh, screws with time, where you can activate it at instant speed, except for the first time you cast it. So this is like a combat trick threat with Flash, and you untap, you have Planeswalker in play. No ultimate here, but a lot of utility. Plus, I've also encounter on a creature. It gets first strikes. So it can be a combat trick. Minus one gets 2-2 two, two Samurai Vigilance, so it can be a, a threat end step. 
and then minus two to exile a tap creature and you gain two life. This card is ridiculously good. Um, they attack you, pop this in, minus two, kill every creature. Awesome. They uh, You win combat with this. You can make two twos with this. Uh, it basically has four loyalty because you play it on their turn. You can plus it and then attack with it and four loyalty. Because it has flash, it's easy to defend. This card's awesome. Uh, this is our first ever Flash Planeswalker. It looks really, really good to me. Definitely one to watch for. Tesmer's back as well. Betrayal, Betrayer of Flesh. Four mana for a four, four loyalty Planeswalker. First activated ability of an artifact control. It costs two less to activate. Sure. Uh, draw two, discard two, unless you discard artifact. Sure. Uh, minus two to make an artifact into a creature. If it's not a vehicle, it's a four, four. So, sure. And then uh, an emblem with... Whenever an artifact you control becomes tapped, draw a card. This feels okay to me. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, the static abilities that do for you. You know, drawing get discarding cards is good. There aren't many artifacts really legal in the format. Nor does it seem like there are many artifacts in the set based on the previews so far. It feels like it's more of an enchantment theme. So we'll see if Tezzer has a home or not. Um, like other Tezzerets, kind of locked into doing artifact stuff. If you're not doing that, not so great. But we'll see. We'll see. This is a to-be-determined kind of card. Speaking of artifacts, the Reality Chip. This is apparently an important piece of a story. Two mana for a legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. Waka, waka. Sure, why not? Look at the top card of your library whenever you want. As long as it is attached to a creature, you may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library. Has Reconfigure, a new ability here. Two mana to attach to a creature you control or unattach from a creature. Reconfigure only is a sorcery while attached. This card isn't a creature. So... Sort of like an equipment that's a creature while you're waiting for waiting to use it, uh, and then you can reconfigure it to equip it, and then you get the effect on it. Um, kind of a weird card. Kind of a weird card because it doesn't really do much by itself. It's an 4 that just kind of sits there and blocks. And then it can get turned on. However, if you go to equip this and they kill for creature response, I don't know what deck wants this card. Uh, it's just kind of a weird card. Kind of cool. Um, kind of a clever design. We'll see. Another to be determined for sure. We got a goblin! There are goblins on Kamigawa. Hopefully more than just this one. Hopefully more than just some, just some for your Mod Monday fans out there. Goro Goro, Disciple of Ryusi. Uh, we got two mana for a 2-2. Legendary Goblin Samurai. Plus one to get haste on a turn. All creatures, all creatures you control. So it's an okay ability. Five mana to make a 5-5 five, five dragon with flying. Activate this only if you control an attacking modified creature. What the hell does that mean? Modified creature is a creature that has an equipment on it, an aura on it, or a counter on it. So it's a creature that's modified in some way, which kind of makes sense based on the name. Uh... This card seems okay. Uh, not really in line with uh, what goblins are usually doing. Uh, goblins usually aren't too big on auras or equipment. Uh, but, you know, kind of seems like a worse version of uh, Dragon King Berserker. Uh, but it's a goblin, and I have hope for more goblins in this set. Surge Hacker Mech. That is not a name I ever thought I'd hear for a magic card. Uh, four mana, five, five vehicle menace. Whenever it ETBs, damage equal to twice the number of vehicles you control to a creature or planeswalker. Crew four. We'll see how many vehicles there are. Uh, these sort of like count all your equipment or count all your vehicle cards typically are pretty bad. Uh, so we'll see on this one. Not really uh, super enthusiastic about it. Perfect segue to our next card here. Another goblin, Enthusiastic Mechanaut. Is it mana for a 2-2 flyer, which is fine. Goblin Artificer. Artifact spells you cast cost one less to cast. This card's pretty good. 2-2 uh, flyer for two is very, very reasonable. And then the uh, cost reduction, also very reasonable. Not the most goblin-y goblin of all time, but pretty solid little two-drop. Looks pretty cool. Silver Fur Master here. We see a Lord for Ninjas and Rogues. It's just a 2-2 two -two for two that pumps other Ninjas and Rogues. Also makes Nujutsu cost one less. And then it has the Nujutsu in and of itself, but doesn't really do anything with it. No, uh, no you know, sabotage uh you know hit your opponent draw a card whatever no effects on it it's just sort of there so pretty cool uh rat ninja lord which is kind of sweet also a rogue lord too shrines are back uh go shintai of shared purpose four mana for a one three vigilance these are now creatures that's right the shrines are creatures now a little harder a little easier to kill a little easier to kill beneath your end step may pay one if you do make a woman spirit for each shrine you control four mana for a one three creatures are pretty uh Pretty rough cost. Probably going to be more of a limited card than anything else. Uh, in limited, you know, a one thing that makes a, makes a token every turn is pretty fine. But uh, not super exciting if you're a Shrine fan out there. I, I apologize. Oh, what's this? This is scary. This is scary. Uh, Jin Gitaxis is here on Kamigawa. Everybody run. Everybody run. Uh, new version of Jin Gitaxis here. Progress Tyrant. 7 mana for a 5-5, five, five, Phyrexian Praetor. This is going to have some serious repercussions. We'll see this a little bit. Whenever you cast an instant, 
artifact or sorcery spell. Copy that spell. Choose new targets. Triggers only once per turn. And of course, if you cast an artifact, it'll be a copy of the permanent. Uh, it'll be a token. Whenever an opponent casts an artifact, instant or sorcery spell, counter it only once per turn, though. So basically, it counters your opponent's first artifact, instant or sorcery spell. Pretty powerful if it's in play, but no flash, no way to protect itself. Very, very powerful card. Freaky looking art. Uh, freaky looking art. Um, will this be a player in constructive formats? I don't know. Seven mana is a lot for for no way to uh, protect itself. In the same mana uh, bracket as Ta, uh, not Tyrant by Tyrant, uh, Hullbreaker Horror. Um, we'll see. We'll see. But big implications here because we move on to Tamio's completion. That's right. The Phyrexians have abducted Tamio and done some nasty stuff to her, and uh, we'll find about that. that about, find out about that in one second here. Four mana for an enchantment or a common. <laughs> I love when the story cards are just like basic commons. It's like this crazy story point, but it's like a limited removal spell. Uh, but for mana aura, flash enchants an artifact creature or planeswalker comes into play. You tap it. If it's an equipment, you unattach it, and it loses all abilities and doesn't untap. Uh, doesn't untap. So this is just your solid to kind of like first pick blue removal spell. Uh, but what it depicts is the real part here. Uh, of course, good drafts common. But what does it depict? This is the big one, folks. If you like Tamio, close your eyes. Oh boy. Tamio completed Sage. Tamio has become complete and is now Phyrexian. I guess that's sort of like the Borg, right? You know, uh, we are the Phyrexians. Resistance is futile. Eh, anyone? No. no? All right, sure. Five mana Planeswalker or four mana and Phyrexian mana. The return of Phyrexian mana. Inconceivable. I know, right? So. Five mana Planeswalker. It is completed. That just means that uh, you can pay the uh, Phyrexian mana. If you do pay the Phyrexian mana, however, Tamio comes in with two less loyalty. So important to note that. Plus one ability. Tap up to one target artifact or creature. Doesn't untap. During controls, next untap step. That's like old Tamio, right? That's great. Uh, minus X. Exile target non-land permanent card with mana value X from your graveyard. Make a token that's a copy of that card. That's pretty powerful. So anything. Artifacts, creatures, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, minus seven. Create Tamio's Notebook. A legendary colorless artifact token. With spells you cast, cost two less to cast, and tap to draw a card. That's that's a pretty good pretty good token. <laughs> that is a... Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not indestructible or anything like that. That's pretty powerful. Um, all in all, though, I'm not super impressed. Um, for five mana, I mean, it's going to be cast for four most of the time, right? Most of the time, it's just going to cost four mana and two life. So four mana Planeswalker with three loyalty. Um, it can tap and lock some stuff down. It can recur things. Kind of a weird ability for blue and green to have. Um, and the ultimate is quite good. It gets there pretty quick, honestly. You get to play it. Uh, as a, if, as a, if it's a five drop, it gets there pretty quick. And uh, get up there and get the notebook in play. Kind of a weird card. I don't really, I don't really get the feel from this card that, like, she's been corrupted in some way, or she's, like, Borgified. Uh, I guess the minus X is a little bit like that, but we'll see. Kind of a kind of a cool one. Big story beat here, of course. You know, this Frexian's messing stuff up again. Frexian's are, are classic uh, enemies in Magic. And uh, that's it. That's the whole preview. So, I'm pumped for Kamigawa New England Dion Dynasty. My name is Jim Davis. First time hit that follow button. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Look for all the stuff I do for a new set. I do set review. I do Bronze to Mythic. Um, I do my love-hate article on CoolStuffInc.com. Tons of stuff coming. I'm pumped for it. You should be too. And uh, make sure you follow the channel. All right, thanks for watching, folks. I appreciate it. And I'll see you for more stuff. See you next time.